despite this being a paper one biology exam, there are some fundamental concepts and principles which you may have picked up in your paper two knowledge, which you must be able to understand to use in your paper one exam. Have a look at this list. The specific things that you would have learned in paper two are meiosis, sexual and asexual reproduction, and how materials are cycled. For example, carbon cycle, water cycle. There could be anything related to those sections in your paper one exam. So make sure that you look over these, revise these, as there is a chance that they could come up. In your exam, you should expect a question on your required practicals. On many occasions, they might give you the method of an experiment, which you need to read and then answer some questions based on it. What you definitely want to do is make sure you read through the method carefully because it will give you an indication of what are the variables in that experiment. Remember that there are three types of variables in any experiment, independent variable, dependent variable, and control variable. You should remember what each of those terms means. They may even ask you what is an independent variable or what is a dependent variable in the investigation given to you. So that means from the method, you should be able to figure it out. One of the practicals that might come up would be on food tests from B2 organization. What it will require you to do is to describe the different chemicals that you may need to test for different foods and state the color changes that they would turn if that food type is present. Watch the following clips to remind you of the different chemicals and the different color changes that appear for the different foods. The questions could be as easy as multiple choice, stating the correct chemical, but it could ask you to describe in detail how you could test for different foods. Remember that there are some risks that come with using certain chemicals, so you need to be able to, if describing, state the safety precautions when using certain chemicals. Another practical skill is drawing scientific images it's related to your microscope practical in B1 cell biology. So there may be a question where it may ask you to give or state the rules for drawing scientific images, give you an example of a drawn scientific image and you need to state ways to improve the drawing, or they may give you a diagram of a cell or specimen that's viewed under a microscope and then you need to draw the scientific images demonstrating that you know the rules. So rules for drawing scientific images. There should be no unbroken lines, no shading. You should label anything that's in your diagram, include a scale or include the magnification. There should be no coloring, no sketching. You must expect at least one question in your paper that's got a table in it and you must expect at least one question that's got a graph involved. The questions could range from stating what the independent or dependent variable is from the table or graph, or it may ask you to describe the trends in the graph or describe the trends in the table, or it may ask you to plot a graph using the data in the table. Remember that from a results table, there should at least be two columns. The first column will always be the independent variable and the second column will always be the dependent variable. If plotting that on a graph, that will mean that the independent variable should be on your x-axis and your dependent variable should be on your y-axis. Some of the graph questions may ask you to put a scale on there 
but that would mean that you would need to use your table carefully and do an even scale either on the x or the y axis. Remember then when including a scale you would need to label your axes carefully so whatever the heading is in the table should go there and also put the unit. If you don't put the unit next to your heading you may lose a mark. Use the lines that's given to you on the graph to help you make your scale and then when plotting make sure you find out what the smallest interval is. By just being off by more than half a square it can prevent you from gaining your marks when you're plotting. After you have plotted your points you're most likely going to be asked to draw a line of best fit. Now a line of best fit can be a curve. Look at your points carefully and then draw a smooth curve through them. You need to make sure you do not connect the dots with straight lines. A smooth curve following the trend of the points will guarantee you your mark for your line of best fit. Another skill you may be assessed on is utilizing the magnification equation. Remember that it will not be given to you in the exam. You need to be able to recall it. Magnification equals image size or image length over actual size or actual length. They may give you two of the three values and you just need to plug them into the equation. But there may be a situation where they give you a figure and then you would need to measure a length of the figure to find the image length and then use the equation. One common thing that the examiners like to do though is they like to test your ability on converting units. So you need to be able to confidently convert between meters to centimeters, centimeters to millimeters, millimeters to micrometers. Every single exam question will have a command word, an indication of how you should be approaching the question and the detail required in your answer. What you want to make sure is you are clear on what each of the command words means because this can be the biggest stumbling block from preventing you from getting maximum marks from any question. Have a look carefully at this picture especially the words in the orange boxes because these are simplified versions of what each command word means for you. Two particular command words that students commonly find difficult are compare and evaluate. They are similar in what they are asking you to do but they are also different. Whenever there is a comparison question what you must put in your answer are the similarities and differences in anything that you can find from the question. But when you are trying to make your comparisons you have to use comparative language so the examiner knows that you are making the distinction between your two points clearly. What are examples of comparative language? Bigger, taller, greater, smaller, faster, slower. All of these indicate that something is different to something else. Look carefully to the answer at this exam question and you should be able to spot the comparative language words that have been used. An evaluation question asks you to do many things which is why it's probably the most difficult command word to answer a question for. When you have to evaluate it will require you to make a comparison. So think about what we did in the previous question. You had to find similarities and differences. That would then require you to use your comparative language. So taller, smaller, faster, greater, higher. You then also would need to find advantages or pros to the specific thing in the question and disadvantages or cons to that specific thing in the question. That also means 
that you will be required to use your own knowledge in addition to the information that's already given to you. You can't just answer and evaluate question by just taking the information from the question and putting it in the space below. That is not an evaluation. The final thing that you will need to do when evaluating is you'll need to write a conclusion. So what can you conclude yourself about all the information and your own knowledge which you have shown? So a conclusion or a judgment would be the final thing that you need to put in an evaluation.